Hey everyone, we live in an incredible time. Now we find ourselves moving into space at a faster pace given the incredible hard work that companies like ULA and SpaceX are doing on the commercialization of access to low Earth orbit. This is allowing NASA to start getting ready for our return to the moon, which is only a test bed as we're going to begin our trek to Mars. Now in this three part video series, we're going to dig into the history and physics of basic rocketry. This will give you a basic understanding of how rockets work. Now, my name is Bob Roberts. I am an aerospace education officer for the Civil Air Patrol, and I'm based here in Greenville, South Carolina. Now, for this first video lesson, we are going to be looking at the history of rockets, and this video series is adapted from the Aerospace Dimensions modules for CAP. We're gonna start our discussion by including the roles of the Greeks, the Chinese, and the British and how America contributed to the development of rockets and the first major rocket missions. Now, rocketry today is simply astounding with the complexities and the scale of these rockets. There is a reason we have a saying, it's not rocket science for a reason. But with all journeys, we have to start somewhere. And that where and when is around 400 BC in ancient Greece, when they built a flying wooden pigeon that they hung from a wire and was sent forward by escaping steam. Now, just a hundred years later, Another Greek named Hero developed a basic rocket engine that also used steam. A round metal sphere had steam enter it through it and exited out pipes that were L-shaped and that spun the engine around and around. It was very simple, but it was a wonderful example to them of Newton's laws of motions, which frankly weren't even invented yet. Now the use of steam by the Greeks was changed to chemical forms of energy by the Chinese. This was in the form of gunpowder. The Chinese used these rockets in a form that we are all too familiar with on the 4th of July in the form of fireworks. Now, they used them just for festivals, and they started experimenting with them around 100 AD. Now, history doesn't note a major change in this usage of rocketry until about a thousand years later when war, unfortunately always the mother of invention, broke out between the Chinese and the Mongols in 1232 AD. Now, instead of using them as fireworks for celebrations, they instead used them as arrows of flying fire to rain down on the enemy's forces. Now the physics, while on a much smaller scale, is not all that much different than the solid rocket boosters that we're actually using today. Now they basically put a, in a material that can be burned rapidly, and in their case, they just used gunpowder, and then they capped it on one end and allowed the exhaust to exit the open end. Now they used a long stick to provide balance and a basic form of guidance to their rockets. Now, over the next few centuries, into the 13th and 15th centuries, the English worked on these rockets. Now, Roger Bacon, now he worked to improve the types of gunpowder used, which allowed the rockets to reach much greater distances. And then on the guidance front, there was a Frenchman who worked on launching the rockets through a tube. Now, if your mind starts to thinking about a bazooka, there's a good reason for that. The bazooka was actually fashioned after that concept. Now forward again about a few hundred years to the 17th century, and science begins to take over. Guiding the future development of rocketry, Sir Isaac Newton articulated the laws of motion, which we're gonna discuss those laws in more depth in the second video, but understand that these same principles are the driving force, force, pun intended, of modern rocketry. Now the raw power of the rockets moved forward militarily in the 18th century when Colonel William Congrave's team developed rockets that could travel thousands of feet instead of just a few hundred. Now they lacked a sophisticated guidance system, but they were very small and they were compact, meaning that they could be launched in large quantities. Now this would strike the panic into the imposing forces, as well as inflict large scale devastation by numerous impacts. Now, just for the first time, enemies could engage each other without actually seeing each other. This led to a feeling of never truly being safe on a battlefield. These Congreve rockets are also very famous to us who live in the United States. Now, in our national anthem, it goes, the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Those rockets in the national anthem, those were Congreve rockets. Now, always looking for ways to improve, the military worked hard to try and develop rockets that would have much better accuracy. One way this was achieved was when William Haley stabilized the rocket by putting small fins on it in order to spin the rocket. Now, this is the same reason that a gun barrel puts a spin on a bullet. It helps them to travel straighter. Now, we are now traveling ahead to the end of the 19th century, where rocket science really starts to progress faster. Now, in 1898, we are introduced to Konstantin Slavkowski, who was a national hero in Russia. 
His work earned him the nickname of the father of modern aeronautics. Now, he proposed that the limit to the rocket was the speed of the exhaust gases. Therefore, he began to experiment with using liquid propellants and not gunpowder. This was a true game changer for rocketry. Now, about three decades later, we have moved from the father of modern aeronautics to the father of modern rocketry. Now, Robert Goddard took many of the ideas of Slavkowski and put them into practice. Now, he started with solid rocket motors, just the same as everybody else, but in 1926, he goes down in history as being the first person to achieve flight with a liquid propellant. The propellant was a mixture of liquid oxygen and gasoline. Now, while we use different propellants today in our current rockets, the practical theories are the same. Now, over time, his rocketry experiments got bigger and bigger. And unlike the other historical rocketry greats, Goddard did not just focus on propellant or guidance. He worked on both. He developed gyroscopic systems to control the guidance of the rockets, and he also introduced parachutes so that they could reuse the rockets. And then lastly, for the scope of this video, he came up with the idea of a multi-stage rocket. Now, multi-stage rockets are so important that they demand a video on their own, but at the most basic, just understand that when you're fighting gravity, you want to be as lightweight as possible. Now, what a multi-stage rocket does is that it gets rid of the weight of the lower portion of the rocket when it is no longer useful. This reduces the overall mass of the rocket, so the force allows for greater acceleration. This multi-stage concept is critical to our current rockets that go into space. Now, at about the same time as Robert Goddard's work, we also have Hermann Oberth. Now, Hermann Oberth was in Germany, and he published a book in 1923 about rocket travel into space. Now, this captured the hearts and minds of the German population, and a lot of amateur rocket groups started to form. Now, much of the work of these amateur rocket scientists, they led to the later development of the V-2 rocket which was a major escalation of scale and technology in the weaponization of rocketry. Now, the V-2's development was led by Werner von Braun, and after World War II, both the United States and the Russians raced to get to the help of those German rocket scientists. This was the beginning of the Cold War. Now, both the U.S. and Russia greatly mistrusted each other, and that stress is probably not as severe, but it actually still exists today. And part of the balance of power that's been in the creation of longer range and more accurate rockets. No longer were rockets only to be used on a battlefield, they could literally be used to hit a target on the other side of the planet. To show off to the world how powerful each country was, the two nations entered a space race. Now, Werner von Braun and about 120 scientists, they came to the United States and they were crucial in our early space program. Now, in the Soviet Union, Sergei Korolev helped to develop the very first working Soviet ballistic missile in August of 1957. Now, showing how important the military aspect of the rocket science was, the first space satellite, Sputnik 1, was launched just two months after the ballistic missile launch. Now, this gave him the title of the father of the Soviet space program. This also shocked the American population due to the realization that they not only were behind the Russians in space, but this could also allow the Russians to beat us into space, or even worse, to attack American soil. Thus, the space race entered another cycle. Now, like the Russians, the U.S. rocketry program was started by the development of medium and long-range ballistic missiles. The Redstone, the Atlas, and the Titan were all such rockets that would launch satellites into space. Now, these types of rockets are called launch vehicles. Since their job was the actual launch of a rocket into space, they would carry with them a payload on top. Now, this allowed the rockets to be designed and to be used by many programs and satellites without having to rebuild a new type of rocket every time they had a different type of satellite. Now, only a few months after Sputnik 1, the U.S. launched Explorer 1 on January 31st, 1958. This is the first satellite to detect the Van Allen radiation belt, and unlike our ideas of rockets being really large, the Explorer 1 was only 7 feet long and weighed just 30 pounds. Now, although it was a lot smaller than Sputnik, it actually reached an altitude of nearly three times higher, with Explorer 1 reaching a height of 903 miles, compared to Sputnik that reached just 359 miles. Now, it's amazing to think that a little rocket that's not much taller than I am and weighing only 30 pounds was able to reach 903 miles, or 4.7 million feet. Now, the space race was now fully on. At this point, space was a matter of national pride for both the Russians and the United States. The United States split up its space programs into two different groups, with a military 
and a civilian. Now, the civilian agency was the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, who we still have, also known as NASA. And that was formed in October of 1958. Now, over the next decades, the Russians and the U.S. were making significant progress in their programs. The Russians were first to launch a person into space. Yuri Gagarin went into space in April of 1961. And again, the U.S. population was shocked that they had just been beaten into space. So just a month later, the young NASA program launched Alan Shepard into space on the Mercury capsule called Freedom 7. Now, the Redstone rocket that launched the Mercury capsule was relatively undersized, so it only reached 116 miles. And sensing that the U.S. was behind the Russians, John F. Kennedy gave the now famous speech, putting the world on notice that America was setting its sights on sending and returning astronauts to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. The Redstone rocket was replaced by the much more powerful Atlas rocket, and this time putting the Mercury capsule Friendship 7 into orbit for nearly five hours, as opposed to the previous Freedom 7, which put Alan Shepard into space for only about 15 minutes. It was at this point the goal of just putting someone in Earth's orbit largely went away, the full resources of NASA went to setting up the infrastructure to put equipment and Americans on the moon. Now, NASA built a new capsule, the Gemini, which was launched on a much more powerful Titan rocket. Now, these rockets launched two astronauts at a time and paved the way to getting the experience needed to go to the moon. And thus, it was time to start aiming at the moon. To do so, we would need to build a rocket that just dwarfed the earlier rockets. Enter the Saturn V. We always think of the Saturn V, but there was actually a 1 and a 1B before the 5. Now, these were a combination of other smaller rockets, but the Saturn 1B did launch Apollo 7, which was the first three astronaut rocket. Now, then the largest rocket ever built by mankind, even to this day, the Saturn V was built with the sole purpose of putting Americans on the lunar surface. On July 20th, 1969, we did just that with Neil Armstrong being the first person from the planet Earth to set foot on the moon. On this July 20th, 1969. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Now with the space race to the moon now won and the incredible expense of the Saturn V rockets, the American public very quickly got bored and the will to financially cover the expenses of the moon missions dried up. Now, with no ambitions or capabilities to even think about going to Mars, the focus of the program shifted back to developing programs for low Earth orbit. Now, the Americans built their first space station. The Saturn V was once again used to launch Skylab into space. Now, Skylab didn't have people staying on it all the time like we think of with the International Space Station. Instead, it had three distinct missions with three astronauts each, the longest lasting 84 days only. Now, because of the incredible launch capability of the Saturn V, Skylab was actually a pretty large spacecraft on itself. It had 11,290 feet of habitable volume. Now, 10 years after Skylab, Russians built a much larger space station called Mir, which had cosmonauts staying in space for very long times, the longest being set by Valery Polovkov, who still holds the record today at 437 consecutive days up in space. Now, after Skylab, the United States set its focus on building a much larger multinational space station. And a part of that plan, we had to build a different launch vehicle. And the goal was to build something that could hold a larger payload and carry more astronauts. Now, while at the same time being cheaper than the Saturn V and reusable. Now, I just finished a video on the Falcon 9 and how and why it lands. You can watch that video from this link up here if you want to learn more about that or the importance of reusability and some of the problems that we have with the space shuttle. Now, after the development, ultimately the two shuttle disasters, the United States seemed to lose its mojo for US manned spaceflight, relying on a relatively old Russian launch technology to take Americans into space. That's called the Soyuz. Now, while at the same time focusing more efforts on satellites and probes and remote vehicles that are going out into the solar system and to Mars. Now, all that has recently changed, though, with NASA's desire to use commercial launch vehicles for low Earth orbit, thus the realizing of United Launch Alliance and SpaceX. Now, ULA is following a more traditional rocketry approach. 
And SpaceX is following a more rapid iteration approach like software developers use, which is among other things has led to reusable self-landing rockets, which is bringing the cost of spaceflight down and allowing us to once again set our priorities to man spaceflight. This time the target is Mars. And that is the end of our video. I hope you join us for our next video in our series where we're going to take a look at the rocketry principles, their systems, and their engines. And now if you found this video helpful, please help the channel out and hit the like button and the subscribe button. It really does make a big difference because it helps the videos get recognized by that whole YouTube search algorithm thing. And also if you're a CAP cadet, please pause the video at the very end of this video because I'm going to be putting up the list of important terms that you're going to need to know for your test. Well, that's it. Look forward to seeing you all in the next video. I hope you all have a great day and we'll see you soon. Thanks so much. Bye-bye everyone.